I speak today on behalf of the U.S. India Business Council, the largest bilateral business association in the United States, whose very mission is to advance and deepen U.S.-India commercial ties. Please let the record show so far that in this proceeding, I feel the most compelling testimony has been presented by Arvind Subramanian of the Peterson Institute of International Economics, whose PowerPoint graphically illustrates the extraordinary alignment and growth that has occurred and is occurring between our two economies. Chairman Williamson, in 2006, when you were nominated to this body by then President George W. Bush, two-way trade was a mere $25 billion. But today, just eight years later, uh, passing that $25 billion mark, two-way trade now stands at $100 billion, just in eight years. In a word, business has been good. It is no wonder President Obama recently reiterated on September 27th with Dr. Manmohan Singh, the partnership between the United States and India will be one of the defining partnerships of the 21st century. Could business be better? The very purpose of USIBC is to deepen business ties, advancing opportunity between these two giant economies. Of course, business could be better. We have both recovered from a disastrous global recession and our approach should be, and USIBC subscribes to this approach, to address legitimate concerns of our industries via candid, thorough, respectful, and straightforward dialogue, and not through acrimonious filings, public hearings, in the headlines of newspapers, or through punitive actions. The United States and India are friendly nations, the world's largest free market democracies. We share values of freedom and hope underpinned by familial ties. We have much at stake, both commercial and strategic. We must strive to keep these attributes foremost in mind. I would like now to respond to the specifics which have been central to USIBC's advocacy over the past two years. On tax, USIBC has consistently called for more predictability on India's tax front. India's tax decision making is opaque. That said, in response to investor concerns, the government of India has demonstrated a notable effort to engage more directly with industry on tax concerns. Just this past year, the finance minister personally traveled to the United States more than three times to meet with business leaders at meetings convened by the U.S.-India Business Council. To further understand complaints from tech companies specifically, the finance minister convened a follow-up meeting in New Delhi to delve into technical information technology tax cases, adjusting certain policies to the benefit of U.S. companies. The Prime Minister of India himself invited industry to engage with him on tax and other matters at a U.S. IBC event in New York on September 27th, just this past year. This unprecedented level of engagement is unusual and demonstrates a commitment to hear companies' concerns and to set policies right. India views foreign investment as essential. In addition, the Central Board of Direct Taxes this year reconsidered a circular on research and development taxation, moving this in line with international norms. Most significantly, India created a new Tax Administration Reform Commission led by Dr. Parthasaki Shon, a globally respected tax expert who has consistently shown a commitment to address business concerns shared by both domestic and foreign investors. On intellectual property, technology and innovation will be key for both our future economies. To achieve greater collaboration in these important areas, it is essential to develop shared ecosystems that reward and protect intellectual property. On issues concerning water and energy security, research and development, diabetes and other health challenges, food security, space exploration, or defense and homeland security, collaboration in technology and innovation will be crucial. More work needs to be done strengthening the protection of intellectual property rights. But interestingly, America's most precious technology, its defense technology, has grown in trade with India from a mere 250 million in 2003 to over $12 billion today. 250 million to 12 billion today. The U.S. government is exchanging and sharing technologies with India that previously it has only ever shared with America's closest allies, Great Britain, Australia, and Japan. 
the growing trust in sharing such, such technology and the IP that goes along with this demonstrates the trust and appreciation on behalf of both governments of the issues at stake concerning sensitive technology and the importance of the protection and safekeeping of IPR. There have been challenges faced in the pharmaceutical sector, but we also cannot ignore the fact that many pharma companies are thriving in India, Abbott, GSK, Gilead, to name just a few. It is important not to mis mistake India as a monolith. India is a federal republic with 31 states, comprised of a dynamic business community in both the private and public sectors, a country which is governed by an executive branch, a legislative branch, with its laws overseen by a respected judiciary. We've heard reference in previous testimony to the Supreme Court ruling against one drug. India's Supreme Court, we must remember, is autonomous from the government. We have heard previous testimony of decisions made in quasi-judicial proceedings in India by quasi-judicial bodies which enjoy autonomy from the government. We recognize India is comprised of an active, entrepreneurial, private, and public sector, which, as in any country, will continue to challenge patents and patentability, but just as true is the fact there are companies in India with new molecules in the pipeline that are champions for innovation, supporting strong IPR. Fortunately, in India, there is due process, both at the quasi-judicial level and in the courts, to uphold India's rule of law. These same courts have issued judgments against certain companies, true. And these same companies, these same courts rather, have issued judgments in favor of companies. India cannot be viewed as a monolith. Companies operating there, and US companies have so far invested $50 billion in India, understand the rules and laws, and have navigated these successfully and continue to invest. Just last month, Pepsi announced plans for a more than $2 billion investment in India. Ford is now nearing completion of its largest manufacturing plant ever outside the United States in the Indian state of Gujarat. These are just a sampling. Companies like Citi and GE have been in India now for more than 100 years and are thriving. It would be wrong, therefore, to tar brush India. Yes, there have been some unfortunate decisions that have dampened investor enthusiasm and USIBC continues to work on these. We do this by engaging India, not by calling public hearings or by initiating punitive action that would revoke GSP or by supporting a 301 downgrade. India is a commercial and strategic partner, the very country we hope to one day call our strongest ally. On PMA and forced localization, USIBC has been consistent in making the case to India that it, it is inappropriate to mandate domestic manufacturing. One cannot snap their fingers and hope infrastructure appears, that reliable electricity will be instantly available, and that high-skilled workers will appear at the factory gate. Infrastructure, soft and hard, requires investment, and the government of India understands that. As in any democracy, there are voices in government that take an alternate view, Considering India's young workforce, with as many as half the population of 1.24 billion under the age of 25, India is searching for ways to create 1.5 million jobs every month, a daunting task. U.S. investors in India are committed to help provide some of these jobs, but we universally agree that manufacturing will not magically appear by virtue of mandate and that manufacturing will only emerge once market forces and infrastructure are in place that support it. That's why USIBC was relieved when the government of India backed away from their PMA policy affecting the private sector. USIBC's board is satisfied that this PMA policy now applies only to India's public procurement, not unlike our own policy for public procurement known as Buy America. This concern response suggests that communication is working. Not that we may rest on our laurels, there is much more to do, but it is important to note the government of India is listening and responding. At USIBC, we are pleased two-way trade is evenly balanced, poised to grow from $100 billion today to a stretch goal of $500 billion by the end of the decade. All sides want this. India has opened nearly every sector to 100% foreign direct investment, barring a few. The finance minister publicly announced that FDI is imperative. 
The flip side is that Indian companies are investing tens of billions of dollars now into the United States. The business relationship is a genuine two-way street. Hearings such as this help remind us how far we have come in the commercial arena, while also calling attention to India's need to calibrate regulations to protect data, or inspire India's future legislature to adjust its patent act to, to align more wholly with international norms, particularly regarding incremental innovation. Certainly, there is awareness by India's leadership that compulsory licenses may discourage innovation. Everyone agrees that India needs to spend more on its healthcare system. All stakeholders in the film and music and software industry, including the government, are aware of the ravages of piracy and recognize the need to improve enforcement and put in place measures that will stem piracy over the long term by better educating the public. And here is the way forward. India's new ambassador to the United States, S. Jayashankar, who arrived in Washington only as recently as December 23rd, two days before Christmas, has already met with industry, including leaders from the pharmaceutical industry. The ambassador has publicly expressed his willingness to address legitimate concerns of U.S. business. On a biographical note, this ambassador is the same individual who championed the U.S.-India Civil Nuclear Initiative together with Ambassador Nick Burns during the 2005-2008 time frame, a genuine friend of the United States, someone who believes in deeper U.S.-India ties. I leave you with one last thought. By May 31, 2014, just 10 weeks from now, 10 weeks from today, India will have elected a new government. In this upcoming national election, which is likely to be announced by the Election Commission in India on or about March 1, more than 800 million voters will exercise their franchise to vote, freely and fairly electing their next government. Gentlemen and ladies, this will be the largest democratic undertaking in human history. As a fellow democracy, this should be celebrated, if not envied, and certainly this process should be respected. Half of this voter population, as many as 400 million people, will be under the age of 25 and voting for the very first time. They are favorably inclined toward the United States. A Pew poll suggests 74% of all Indians have a favorable view of the United States. Let us be careful not to inflame the sentiments of an emotive India which is on the move. Mr. Summers, I'm sorry. Let's be fair to everybody. The risk is that we force the hand of India's next government to buy European or Japanese instead of American. In conclusion, the promise of the uh, 20th... You'll get a chance to question if this doesn't wrap up, but I, I really got to be fair to people. Uh, three more sentences. Well, can we, no, I will give you a chance during questions to, to back it up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, it's just, well, the commissioner should accept my advice.